what really the thrive state is, that how we live our life, particularly in those five pillars of things, physical, which includes sleep, nutrition, movement, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual, all create an energetic field in our body. And that energetic field, that energy gives messages to our DNA to either give us chronic health or chronic disease, because the same five things, how you live your life is medicine, but how you can live your life, if lived unconsciously from programming of survival, of fear, that will drive the stress hormone. Welcome back to the show. My name is Courtney. We've got Dr. Chris Motley with us here, and I'm super pumped for our conversation with Dr. V. He is a triple board certified interventional and diagnostic radiology doc, as well as an anti-aging and regenerative into the field of regenerative medicine. He's the founder of VU MD Performance and Longevity and has advised everyone from athletes, executives, celebrities, and organizations towards longevity and peak performance. He is the number one best-selling author, if you haven't seen his book, Thrive State, which we're going to talk about a little bit today, and I'm super excited to get into it. He's a media expert. He's a keynote speaker. He's been on so many different platforms, including Bank of America, J.B. Morgan. He's performed um, even in areas like ABC. So he's all over the place, guys. This is such a treat, such a privilege to have you with us. So thank you for joining us for today's conversation. It's a pleasure to be on. I love the vibes already. So I am ready to get into it with the CNC Health Factory. <laughs> that's our that's our new nickname, Doc. The, the C, it's right started right here with Dr. V, the CNC. Um, this has been going to be a good experience. I know that so much. But and Courtney's always good with the intros, and she's always good with the outros. So that's why I let her do this because she just rails it off really well. Hey, you know what? We're uh, it, it's a it's a team effort here, the CNC Health Team, which I, I like that we've coined that now. So maybe we'll just. We'll roll with it for <laughs> moving forward because it kind of has a nice little like, you know, vibe to it. So, yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, and Dr. V, I mean, there's I, your story, first of all, is incredible. And I would love I don't even want to bypass that because I know that it has so much significance in the purpose of what you do today and even your book and everything that you speak about. So let's maybe even just start there. Like what has the experience? experience you've been through, the adversity and the trials from a very, very early age. I mean, it goes all the way back to the beginning. Like what has that meant in really where you serve today, the purpose that you serve out today? Well, I think great, great questions. And um, I'm going to start, we'll do a movie scene where we start back maybe seven years ago, and then I'll take you all the way back to when my parents were in the back seat of, no, I'm kidding. Not that far back. <laughs> <laughs> that goes but way back. Seven years ago, uh, a interventional radiologist, chief of interventional radiology at my hospital, and then I found myself achieving what I thought would give me a beautiful life. You know, chief of interventional radiology, got my dream house, dream car. But with all of that, I was sick. I was overweight. I was diabetic. I had high blood pressure. I was on several prescription medications. And I realized then that I wasn't really given the tools to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did a lot of changes to my diet, nutrition, and movement. And that shifted a lot of things. But as I got deeper into health, as I started to uh, study with spiritual shamans, as I started to do a lot of personal development work, I didn't realize that it was the program which I was living in, living in what we now know today in science to be the default mode network, these mm -hmm. subconscious programs that, that we come with that we live life through our reality actually creates disease and we're not aware of it. So let's now take us back to the very beginning. So I was born in post-war Vietnam and, um, you know, my, my parents had, had gone through uh, seeing a lot of bombs and guns and hearing all those things. And, you know, when I was born, it was after the Vietnam War and for many people living there, it wasn't a place to raise your kids. And so they wanted to leave. And so they tried to escape on a refugee boat. And the first time we tried to escape, they got caught. That was when my mom was pregnant with me. Mm. My dad got sent to re-education camp there. My mom was forced to sing to the to the troop, to the Viet Cong, because she, you know, she was a pharmacist and a singer. Six months later or so, my dad gets released. I'm born without him by my side. And 
we escape again. We're, we're on a refugee boat filled with 2,000 other refugees. We end up outside Manila Bay in a Philippine refugee camp. We end up staying on that boat for eight months. I was the only infant to survive that boat. We spend another three months in a Philippine refugee camp, and then we come to America. And one would think, hey, a kid that had gone through all that would be so grateful to be alive, to be in this country. Um, but I remember growing up, you know, I didn't see it in kids that looked like me. And when I got bused to school, I was constantly being teased for the holes in my hand-me-down clothes and the stinky food my mom sent me to school. Go back to your home country, chinky. You know, I got a lot of that. And so I started to develop this idea and notion that somehow I wasn't enough. Mm. Not tall enough, not American enough, not white enough. You know, you name it, I didn't feel that. And so that was my programming. And I went through my entire life chasing this thing called success, thinking that this thing outside of me, the accolades, success, grades will actually let me be worthy. And so that's what I did was I, I chased those things. Mm. And I got everything that I thought was supposed to bring me a happy and healthy life. Yeah. And then I found myself back in that place as an interventional radiologist, you know, uh, really uh, 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 a young physician going around the world speaking on, on the new advances in interventional radiology, not knowing that basically how I was living my life created a disease state. Mm -hmm. And when I started to discover that, when I started to remember who I am, when I started to remember the things that brought me joy, the things that lit me up, the things that made me me, as I stepped back into that original aspect of me, I started to notice a more profound shift in my physiology. Mm -hmm. And so all this to say that what I have discovered, the most important thing is how we live our life is actually medicine. And so I'll pause there and see if you want to dive into anything I, I just said. Wow, that is profound. I'm not kidding about how programming, like you say, that's medicine about how you live your life. <clears throat> I was having a conversation with one of my friends. Uh, we were having a walk this morning and we were just talking about um, the small, subtle things that we think are very light in our life. Like when you have gone through that adversity and then let's say taking a walk or being out in the sun or taking the time for yourself to actually say, well, I'm going to go walk for my own health. But what we, I don't think I realize, or many of us don't realize, is that it's the small things that accumulate, but it does program you to actually think that you're worthy to mend, that you're worthy to be healed. But when we put ourselves in that constant rush state, Doc, I mean, it's telling our bodies, right? Like, well, I'm not, well, I don't have enough time to mend, and I don't have enough time to take care of myself. And we're seeing this in the culture today. And that's what I love about your information on your Instagram page, and even with your book and how you talk about how do you thrive? Like, we're not talking about like, oh, I just, you know, hopefully I get by. You're actually saying, no, life can be lived in a very fulfilling way. And that story, like when you went through that adversity, people coming after you because race and culture, and then you pulled yourself up. To me, it's so inspiring. My mom's from Korea. She's first generation here. And I mean, the adversity she had, I remember she used to go clean houses with my brother on her back and tied up on her back and such. And um, and to go through that and seeing her become a success and, and seeing you, this is like um, such really inspiring already for me. And man, we want to jump in some questions with you, Doc. And, and Do remember, you don't, we don't want to overtake the convo. You're such a great speaker. So I'm saying you can say anything. You can jump in and tell us and, and, uh, anything you want to tell us. But when we talk about the Thrive State, when we're talking about like your programming, describe just in the book, we talk about, you talk about how you can actually create a mind state like what drew you to the field of longevity and what are some of the um, things that you've seen the developments that you've seen in the past years that excite you about it? I know that's a two-part question but tell us what you think yeah well why I got into longevity was certainly you know kind of by accident but one I was sick and mm -hmm. I wanted to not be sick. And so I started to re reach out to different tools, you know, in integrative medicine, functional medicine uh, to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And the more I started to dive into the space, I, I was like, wow, there's so much technology that's around. There's stem cells and exosomes that allow us to regenerate our body. Uh, PRP we can use, you know, extract growth factors from our blood and give it back to ourselves. There are new diagnostics taking MRIs all over our body, these wearables that track our heart rate variability in our, in our sleep. I'm like, wow. And so I really, you know, geeked out of all that technology and it was super exciting. And, and as I started to adopt certain of those things, I noticed a shift in my biological age. And then when I started to dive in deeper into the field in the field of consciousness, 
um, and, and, and trying plant medicines on my own, I started to realize something. Mm -hmm. And when we start to actually study the longest lived people on the planet, the people who are the happiest on the planet, and I'll tell you, happiness, this feeling that we have, it's a life force. And it's messages we give to ourselves. And we start studying the people that live in the blue zones. Mm -hmm. They don't have access to wearable devices, to stem cells, to exosomes. They're not doing a bunch of all this diagnostic testing. So yes, there's something I call the science of longevity. But how are they living so long? How are they living longer than, than those of us that, that have all this technology? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that how they live their life is actually medicine. And so I did my own research. So in Thrive State, what I did is I extracted these knowledge that they lived in the blue zones. And I said, oh, wow, the way they sleep, move, eat, the physical aspects actually causes a shift in their biology. It actually makes new changes in your DNA and changes your, your genetic expression. Mm -hmm. Well, not only the physical things, but your emotional, mental, your social, your community, and whether or not you're serving people with a sense of purpose that actually causes molecular changes around your cells, giving your DNA new signals. And it actually shifts methylation markers in your DNA that actually changes the gene expression. And so how you live your life can activate the biology of peak performance and longevity. That's mm -hmm. what I had, had discovered. And that's what really the thrive state is, that how we live our life, particularly in those five pillars of things, physical, which includes sleep, nutrition, movement, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual, all create an energetic field in our body. And that energetic field, that energy gives messages to our DNA to either give us chronic health or chronic disease, because the same five things, how you live your life is medicine, but how you can live your life, if lived unconsciously from programming of survival, of fear, that will drive the stress hormone because those signals are telling your body that a saber tooth tiger is chasing after you. Mm -hmm. And what happens in, in that mode? Well, it turns on a gene complex called the conserved transcriptional response to adversity. And when that gene complex turns on, mm -hmm. inflammation goes up. Why? Because you might get a flesh wound from a, an attacker or a saber tooth tiger. And it's also going to decrease your immune system because why expend energy on curing infection and cancer when you're about to be someone's lunch? Wow. So wow. that's the thing is we can control this energetic message that we give to ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. And that that's what the Thrive State is really about. Oh, man. This is just opening up so many areas that mm -hmm. I feel like we could just go so deep on. But I want to go back to something that you first talked about when you were in that state where you were sick, like your body was inflamed, you were carrying extra weight, you're in school, like probably putting in an insane amount of hours every single week. So I'm curious to know, and this is probably, th th there's a lot I'm sure of overlap in Thrive State, your book, but how in that moment, in that place, when you start to recognize or realize that, hey, the way that I'm living my life right now is showing up in my physical state, mm -hmm. my physical mm -hmm. being, so how in that place, what did you do to get yourself on this road of becoming more conscious, becoming more aware and changing, changing the future trajectory so that your body could have now margin to start healing? Because I think that a lot of people get stuck. All of a sudden they may start to be able to put the pieces together. Like, you know what? It's, it's all the things that I have signed up for to this point that are, that have now brought me into what I'm feeling right now, but they don't know, like, how do you get yourself out of it? Mm. Well, mm -hmm. one thing to really recognize is one cool factor, like in Thrive said, what I talk about those five things, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and social, they're all energetically connected. Mm -hmm. And when you start to make one change in any one of these categories, it shifts the energy of the entire system. And so when I first started, I just worked on sleep, nutrition, and movement, the physical aspects. Then I started to notice a shift in my body already. It changed the physiology of everything that was going on. So I started to just feel better. And all of a sudden you build energetic momentum to make other changes in your life. Now, if that old programming comes in, it could continue to kind of like 
yeah, I don't know, pull you back, self-sabotage you when you want to make some of those changes. And I, and certainly during my um, healing journey, I noticed like my old self pulling me back, like, oh, I'm reaching for that, for, for the sugary foods again. Oh, I'm feeling not, not so good right now, feeling lazy on the couch, I just want to binge on, on Netflix. And, and I succumbed to that. Mm -hmm. Once I started to realize that there was more involved in this energetic state, that it was also mental and emotional, and I started to then tap into what was what's the operating system that's driving all these triggers that make me not want to do things. Hmm. At that point, I learned about something called the default mode network. Hmm. The default mode network is a primitive aspect of our brain and nervous system that is part of this meat suit that we have. You know, in, in animals, anytime it sensed fear, it would run away and it would learn things that could potentially put us in danger. Well, we are more complex animals, but we have this reptilian system that we're learning. And so as kids, who do we learn from? Our parents or media, uh, coaches, teachers, society, it teaches us all these things, but it also remembers the things that hurt us, take basic human needs away from us, such as safety, such as love, such as connection. And so as little kids, when we don't understand these things and we, 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 we somehow feel like love is taken away or we're not seen as ourselves, that's danger to us. And then mm -hmm. so we start adapting mechanisms, putting on masks of people who we are not, and we would go ahead and live life in that way. And that becomes the default mode programming. And as long as that program is on, if it's unconscious, you're, there's, there's going to be things that you'll, you'll say to yourself, I want to be this person, but it just pulls you back. Mm -hmm. Once we start to be able to see that, we can start to make new changes. Like, oh, man, that I just got triggered. I, you know, I want to yell at this person in front of me because they, they just said how, what a terrible person I am and calling mm -hmm. me names. Mm -hmm. Can I sit back and recognize that, no, I am worthy, I am love, and I want to show up in connection and love with this person? Can I pause? Can I not react? Because the reaction comes from the default mode. Can I remember who I am and who I want to be? And if, if it's love and connection that I choose, how then do I show up at this point here? And the more and more we do that, we can start to retrain ourselves from this old programming to the new programming. And that's what it was for me at that point was one, having awareness of the programming that, that like, you know, blocked me in my relationships and my health and success in other areas in my life as well. That's amazing, Doc. So when you're taking a step back for those of everybody else that is listening out there, that you're definitely trying to, like you say, reprogram. And it is a good concept. It's like, it's like learning to ride a different bike. It's like learning how to eat different food. And when we look at it in that way that you just described, people out there may think, oh, you mean just step back and, and you got to think about like, yes. And I think the, re the way you explained it, and even the book, how you talk about how your brain is basically like rewiring itself, like your brain literally rewires itself. And I think I was going to ask you with this, like this new, like the, uh, the default mode network, when you're taking those steps and you can reprogram, I love the way you put spirituality to it. So I want to ask you your concepts of the energy behind medicine, like how, how does it relate to how you express your health? Like, I mean, what are the steps? What are the things you do like bioenergy? And I, this is my, I love this stuff. I love frequency medicine. I do acupuncture stuff like this. And I just love learning and gleaning. So can you tell us about bioenergy and how it relates to your genes and your body's expression? Oh, absolutely. So every form of energy is neither created nor destroyed. Mm. So it's transferred into different uh, messages. So mm. we take the energy of light, for example. All of a sudden, you've got light photons entering your eyes. It hits receptors in your eyes that are sensitive to light. All of a sudden, an electrical potential changes it into electrical energy that then courses basically in, into your brain and starts to release chemicals, neurochemicals, serotonin, for example. All of mm -hmm. a sudden, you've got these serotonin molecules feeding different areas of your brain. You start to feel different. You can see how energy is just transferred from one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. So everything is energetic input. Mm -hmm. And so, and those five air categories of life, they're all energetically connected. And so if you could just tell yourself, man, I'm just, you know, if you s spend one night not sleeping very well, mm -hmm. you're almost telling your body you're in danger. So um, insulin spikes, 
uh, cortisol spikes up. So your blood, blood sugar levels are going to be high. And that's, it's almost kind of creating a diabetic state just from a couple of nights of bad sleep. Mm -hmm. But if you can control that, you start to shift the energy. You're in a safe place now. You're in a rejuvenated state. You're starting to give different me messages to your cells. So mm -hmm. everything you do in each one of those categories will either bring your energy up or bring mm -hmm. your energy down. And you're starting to feed different messages to your cells every single day. And then there are things that I teach in my course um, of, of how to activate your state. Because of what we know about energy, those five things and the habits you have in those five areas of your life is the foundation of your bioenergetic state. Mm -hmm. But you could hack into that state because with every, ener with every energy, there's a certain emotion. With mm -hmm. every certain emotion, there's a corresponding pattern to how we posture, to how we speak, to how we breathe. Look at it, an anxious or depressed per person. They're slouched over, they're hunched over, they're, they're probably breathing from their chest. So you could actually see and feel somebody who's depressed. But if you could just hack your body, I teach people how to do laughter yoga and just like laugh, even when they don't feel like it. But when mm -hmm. they start doing it for a couple of minutes, all of a sudden they're like, wait, something's happening. Mm -hmm. And when you're just doing that, you're hacking the system we know endorphins in your body get naturally released, which is a feel-good hormone and also a painkiller. Mm. So all these things are energetically connected. So what you think, what you do, how you feel is energy. And the more you become conscious of the energy that's in your body, the more you are conscious of the messages you're giving to your cells. And the message you give to your cells give you your, your, your phenotype, whether you've got chronic disease, stress, overweight, brain fog, all these symptoms, or whether yeah. you're in the thrive state, which is the state of optimal health, longevity, and peak performance. Man. I love you, that. Yeah. I love that this is really connected to identity. And I think that it is, there's so mm -hmm. much power behind knowing who you are and the yeah. value that is on your life. Because I don't see any way where you can heal your body from physical symptoms if you are constantly affirming these seeds of doubt of I'm not worthy of healing, I'm, I don't have value or purpose in my life. So how do you help somebody or what is, what, mm -hmm. how would you um, coach somebody on helping them find? Cause a lot of people are lost. Like a lot of people get so far down the road mm -hmm. and they think, I don't even know what I'm designed for. I just know that I made a series of choices that met the needs and the demands on my life in that particular season. But I could be so far from what it is that I'm really good at, like the best mm -hmm. in the world at. So how do I get back to that? How do I connect with myself to really start to feel the value that, hey, I'm serving a purpose that is just for me. That's not mm. anyone else's purpose because I, I think that that will break chains. Like that is the stuff that will give people exactly what you're saying. It hits all those different areas. But if you can't access that one part, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's almost like you stay shackled, you know, and, and, and almost buried under so much weight. Yeah. Well, I mean, one, it's to remind people mm -hmm. and to know, and here's the other thing when I work with people mm -hmm. is I have a deep belief that they are love mm -hmm. and that each and every one of us are connected in the larger organism that is humanity and that we are individual cells brought here for a very specific purpose for that. And when we are working with people, if we have that belief in others, mm -hmm it gives a safe space for them to, to really step into who they really are. And that's who we really are. If we take a look, I have a two and a half year old now, and I just look at how vibrant she lives life. That's who we naturally are. I mean, if, if, if you're given all the things that you need, you know, food, shelter, water, all these things, we're, we're, we're naturally curious beings and, and we follow what makes us feel good. But when we start to learn from the people around us, potentially yeah. our uh, parents that have programming that they carried for generations and the society around us. And, and what most people in society say is, no, the thing that make you feel good might not be good for you. No, we need to do this now. You should be studying that now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we start to shift who we are. We forget that over time. And I know back seven years ago, I was like, what big, what makes me happy? What makes me come alive? I, I, I don't know because you, you were, you spent so much time saying no to who you are to become oh. someone else. Wow. Right. Wow. And so 
how do you how do you start that? Well, one, there's several processes I do. One, I lead them through transformational breath work. And then mm. transformational breath work is really um, powerful because what it does is when you take people through this breathing process, you blow off CO2, you increase the alkalinity in your blood and you actually start to constrict some blood vessels. You constrict blood vessels to your brain. And one of the part it actually slows down or quiets is what? The default mode network. When oh. you can quiet the programming down, you start to have access. You're able to maybe release some of this old programming and, and, and negative energy that's in you. And you can tap into new possibilities of who you really are. And other things that they could tangibly do in life is when you're in a place where you're inspired, like out in nature or after a breathwork session, just identify who you want to be and define who, what that is and start writing down a bucket list. And it's not, oh, some things that I'd love to do before I die. Don't think of it as that. Think of a bucket list as things that you want to experience in life, the travel that you want to do, the people that you want to spend time with, what that all looks like, all the different experiences, who you want to serve. And you start creating these things that, that just make you come alive. If, if it inspires you, put it down as part of a bucket list of, of things you do. Because these might be the things that have been hidden when you're like, no, I, I, I got to work. I, you know, how, how do you have time to do these things? Well, when you start working on them, what you'll start to discover is this. There's going to be certain things you put down and you thought were going to, going to excite you, like winning a million dollars or something like that. And you experience the thing and you're just by going, oh, you know what? It doesn't do anything for me energetically. That mm -hmm. doesn't change. Then you'll find some things that you're doing. You're like, hmm, no, this, the more I'm into it, the more energy it feeds me. The more mm -hmm. creative I am, the more inspired that I am, the more joyful I am, the more it brings these feelings of gratitude. Follow that. Because if you could follow that, that is basically the, the path of bringing you back to you. Because mm -hmm. that's who we are. We mm -hmm. are those emotions. And we tap into that. The things that inspire you, light you up, you know, make you creative, those feelings are written in your DNA. There's no, but you're, those things, who you are is unique, just like your fingerprint is unique. Mm. And when you can tap into that and start living life, just like trying all these different things that inspire you. Okay, that doesn't work. This thing really does. And you follow that. Ooh, you start to tap into an energy that like brings in all this crazy synchronicity. And those also activate the biology of optimal health, longevity, and peak performance. That wow. is amazing, Doc, because when you start to use transformational breath work, when you start to coach somebody, what are some of the things like, let's say I'm, I'll talk to you like, Doc, okay, what are the things like you would see in your people you coach, in your clients, in your patients, and you go, oh, you're living, not blaming them, just saying you're living a little bit out of the old programming, you're living, you know, in the ego, and we can pull you out here, like when your biology can shift and change. Are there some signs and symptoms that you could give the people out there like, hey, if you got this going on, you may be living in the old person or the old programming and and we want you to start to connect with your higher self with a little bit more of the higher conscious. Um, are there some small signs and symptoms or some big ones that you would say, hey, you can do this transformational breath work, but you need to recognize something. So what are some of those things that you see in your in your patients? Well, I, I find this when people feel like crap. That's when you're, that's when you're in the crap programming. <laughs> All right. So when you're feeling like crap, if, if, if you've got low energy, if you've got brain fog, if you've got symptoms of any kind, you're feeding your body, you're in a program that's causing you to make unconscious choices, most likely mm -hmm. that is causing you to have physical symptoms, mental symptoms, emotional symptoms, because they're all energetically connected. Mm -hmm. And so I start to teach people that. And so that when they're starting, so, so that way, some people are just so used to feeling like crap that they're like, oh, okay, that's, that's like me, you know, it's like a fish swimming in the water, not knowing it's swimming in water, mm -hmm. you know, but if they could start to, you know, sense that, and then with each little thing, start to recognize, oh, there's a little trigger here. There's some, some negative charge here. I allow people through breath work and smaller breathing exercises to just pause Four, seven, eight breathing is great for that, where you breathe in through your nose for four, hold for seven, then a long exhale for eight, because those oh. long exhale activate the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve activates your parasympathetic nervous system. That brings you in a state of calm and relaxed. And so every time you feel triggered, 
that's that's the other thing too. It's a great thing to be triggered. Beautiful thing to be triggered. It might not feel great, but it's good because it says something here. It says something that there's something in your programming that's recognizing something out here as something to, to you know that, that's this danger of fear. Mm-hmm. And honestly, unless you're you know being attacked by somebody, gun to your head, saber the tiger next to you, it's all just this this fluff programming. And if you could recognize that trigger basically is something un- inside of you that you could potentially heal, you won't look at that trigger and go, oh man, damn it. There's that thing that happened again. Oh, she's always yelling at me or she's always doing this. You can be like, oh, wow. There's something that's triggered in her. But if I know I'm loved and if I know I'm worthy, that doesn't have to happen here. And I could still choose how I how I come up. But if somebody's yelling at you and telling you, you know, what's a pe- pe- piece of crap you are and if you feel triggered by that then hmm it might be showing you that there's still some some of you that feels like you might be a piece of crap mm-hmm. right That's- and that it, it opens it opens up the things in you that you you could potentially heal so you could wow. take you could take the like that understanding that when something's being triggered inside of you that you could see that as a gift a divine gift that there's indications that there are things that you're missing about yourself, that you, you're not loving yourself. You're not accepting love. Then, and when you get triggered, it's like, instead of looking at it as something like, oh, I'm getting really abused, but also look at it and go, this is an opportunity. That's a beautiful way to put it, Doc. I'm sorry, Courtney, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that is amazing. I love that. It's an opportunity. Okay. I never would have thought about it like that either. So it's, I think that it's important to be said. And I think there is something to be said too, where when you heal those parts of you, those things that maybe get hurled at you, that you feel like, whoa, that was like a cheap shot that, you know, blindsided me. There's not the, there's, there's not an emotional power or energy behind it because there's some resiliency there where it's like, Hey, I don't have to receive that on a personal level. Like, I can recognize where that's maybe coming from in you from a deep woundedness and not necessarily just, Hey, I'm coming at you. And that's a really tough thing to learn. And something that I've, you know, personally been still in the process of learning, but I can, I can appreciate it. I am too. You know, the relationship I thought was the relationship from hell uh, for me um, in, in my past years, as I started to evolve, as I started to understand the default mode, Mm-hmm. As I start to understand that it is the hurt people that hurt people, mm-hmm. you could start to have better compassion for the people in front of you. You could see them as the innocent child before all the wounding that they had from potentially their parents and their environment. And if you could show up differently from a place of, because, you know, those people, you know, that that come charged at you sometimes expect you to come back and, and, and fight. And that perpetuates the pattern over and over again but if you could show up as a space as a space of love then all of a sudden there that energy isn't met, met with resistance you're not making them feel bad like hey, hey this is your old trauma coming up you know but having more compassion for that that not only gives you the ability to maintain your energetic state but two you allow the space for other people to be able to heal themselves as well Mm. I, I love when, when you're feeling that energy come to you, doc, when you're coaching individuals, let's say somebody's coming at you and they are, you know, just coming at and they're just saying all the wrong things. And you start to go like that yin yang aspect. It's like, if I keep um, pushing back, I just keep the wheel turning. Yeah. When, when you see that energetically, when is there a time? Like you feel like, I know that I'm going to give them space, their space. I know I can recognize what's going on in my life that you know that it's going to create a healthy aspect of you that you go, okay, this is going to allow me to let go of old programming. Like maybe I can't be around this person anymore. That energetic latch on, is there like some signs that you go, this person's energy is latching onto me. I've given them space, but I know that there are people out there listening like, man, there's some people that, you know, you give them space and they'll, but their energy is draining you. Like it's completely doing that. Do you have like those thoughts about that? Like, you know, cause we're in this whole world and we want to be around people and, I like, you know, if I'm feeling, feeling that I'm feeling love for people, but there's always that one person that comes in the room sometimes and like, ah, I just took my level down like 50 notches. What would you tell when you're coaching people about that? Well, we're all in different 
aspects of our ability to be able to respond instead of react. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, I didn't get to finish earlier, but when I said, you know, earlier on, I thought I was in this relationship from, from, from hell. Now I almost feel like the relationship has been gifted to me for me to be wow. able to see all these different things, see what's coming up in me, see what's coming up in her. Mm -hmm. And it's been beautiful because the more triggered I get, the more I'm like, oh, wow. That was a wound that that I had too. This is why I'm responding in this way. Mm -hmm. Oh man, can can I heal that? Because if I could heal that, then that charge won't be there, and I could be better. I could show up better for this person. And if we could see the other, per, you know, people as as people that truly love us, then we could have more space. And so, for a lot of people in relationship, I, I I would I would urge people to give it more time, even when it's feeling messy, because that's when people leave. Because everybody gets into the honeymoon phase that they love, and then basically the default mode comes up. And the, when the default mode comes up, then it's like two people interacting with each other, you know, from from old programming. But mm -hmm. that's a, you know, and they're like, no, screw it, Let, let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. But if you don't recognize those things, you never get a chance to heal who you are. Mm -hmm. And so that's number one. To answer your question about what to do around, so people are in different journeys of how they're healing. And if people are bringing you down, you could feel that you need to be able to hold a boundary, remove yourself from a situation like I can't participate in this right mm -hmm. now, I mm -hmm. need to leave, you don't have to go jump back onto the yin yang, don't do that, mm -hmm. where you're participating and just say, hey, you know what, I need to be able to leave. As we get better, as we start to heal ourselves, and as we become more of a space of this calm, loving energy, we can be in those situations so much better. And be able to respond instead of react. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I am constantly evolving. I don't think uh, I will, you know, spend my, my my meat suit lives here ever reaching that place. But I could say day to day that I am improving a little bit with with time. That's good, Doc. Yeah, good doc. that's really good. I think the, the the growth aspect too, you know, if you're listening and you're like, well, I don't know, I feel like I'm trying to control all these different things in life. I'm trying to control my relationships. I'm trying to control my household and, you know, children. And you add in all these variables and, you know, before you know it, you're exhausting yourself and you're still neglecting the one person that you really actually, you're the only one that you have complete control over. So I, I think that I really like the emphasis here of, really just looking at the opportunity through your own eyes. Like, Hey, I'm in this situation and I maybe can't control all the variables around me, but how, how is this going to grow and refine me? Like, what is this pointing to that maybe can really sharpen me in a way that I, like, I wouldn't have been able to see it any other way, just a softness, honestly. And, and having, you know, there, there is some level of like, Hey, I'm not going to tolerate if it's like some level of abuse and that's a different type of situation. But, um, hmm. I just think that have knowing like having enough space or grace for somebody, if you know that, Hey, they they're growing too, they're committed mm -hmm. to growing mm -hmm. because we're all so messy and life isn't perfect and linear. It's just messy. But, you know, I think like so much of what I'm taking from this conversation is the value of life. Like we talk about longevity and it's something that I would say all of us want to attain, but what is living a long time if we didn't serve a greater purpose, if we didn't get to do mm -hmm. life with people that were building us up, that were championing, championing, uh, you know, the things that we were putting our hand to. So, um, I, I, I would love to just, you know, kind of even circle back to the longevity piece, you know, what thrive state, like you've got your, you've got this incredible book and I just am so encouraged and inspired by, not only your personal testimony, but how you've really been able to pull out like practical things that you're like, this can't, like, this is accessible. Like if I can do it, you know, you can do it too. So from this, you know, purpose and longevity standpoint, like what is the big takeaway for somebody that's reading your book or following your story that like, if it was your banner, you know, it's like, this is what I want people to grasp. If they could get this, I feel like, you know, my mission, my purpose is served. Mm -hmm. hmm. Wow. Deep question. Um, <laughs> I, I would probably say this. I would probably say if you could just remember the miracle that it took to bring you here on this planet, 
mm. a miracle that one particular seed out of millions of seed went into that perfect egg in the right moment it created you and from that place, you've had these cells interacting with each other, little, little tiny cells that bring together heart, lung, kidneys to perform all these complex functions that are so mind blown. Mm -hmm. And you are still alive from that. Ooh. If you could recognize that it is your worthiness, that you are loved in such a way and you are connected to everything else that's out there right now, that you are a part of all of this. If you could recognize that's who you truly are, mm. you'll, you'll begin to remember that energy and remember that you're a part of something bigger and that energy, that, that, that purpose. And then if you could be in that place and just tap into that state of purpose of life, of, of, of knowing that your uniqueness, what makes you feel alive actually brings more years to your life as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we talk about longevity, it's really about remembering to create a beautiful masterpiece for a life. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it doesn't have its downsides and its struggles. Those things have also gifts because with those things, we can grow from it. We learn from it. We're stronger. We become more better as an individual cell of the organism that's humanity. And when we are better, we could serve more people. And as we serve more people, we also energetically feel great. So that's who we are. So remember that you're already the gift. And when you can tap in and remember that's who you are, then I think how we treat each other, how we treat our bodies, that will shift. Mm. And, you know, we are also our best medicine. Oh, Doc, I'm, I'm inspired by this. And I truly mean that because I love the way you put it into format and I, and even how you could, just from this podcast, it's like you can recognize your purpose with gratitude. You can see how loved and well and worthy you are. Then you can make your bucket list and find out how the energy comes in the body, what enlivens your energy, what creates the chi that makes it flow. And if you can take that and sustain it, like you're going to have a life that's not based on money or based on like your stature. It's like literally what creates a huge energetic flow. And then you, and I love the way you said this, that in your personality, smiling, doing a laughing yoga changes your biochemistry and the biochemistry actually changes the physical expression. So you're going from the very point of your conception all the way through saying you can have a good blueprint. And I think, I mean, I'm going through all this, how my brain will categorize. And so for everybody out there, read the book, listen to this, and I just can hear it in your voice, the gratitude. And I'm so thankful for that part of this whole conversation. Thank you, brother. Yeah, so good. Man, guys, I hope that you are feeling so encouraged by this conversation. I know that I am, and I can speak for Dr. Molly. And, I, you know, this is just, um, you know, if, if you have felt at any point, you know, hey, I just feel lost. I don't feel like, I don't even feel like I know myself then like this message was for you know that there is always a divine appointment. So this is not just in my opinion, like this is not just happening. Like you're just, you didn't just land on this podcast because it just popped up. Like it is intentional and you were meant to hear this message. It's for you. And I've, I mean, it was for me today. Like it just, you know, yeah. there's always a different part of the conversation that maybe is meant for you. But if you're listening, just be encouraged that wherever you are right now, it is serving a purpose. And whatever you've experienced up to this point has been fine tuning you. It's been the training field for what you've always been meant for. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't been wasted. You know, sometimes we think like, gosh, I've wasted so much time. Like, I wish I could have changed all these things. And I've said that too. And then I look back and I think, but would I be sitting right here if I would have changed that stuff? No. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, I probably wouldn't have as many kids. <laughs> I wouldn't take them back. You know, I mean, I, sometimes I'm like, whoa, boy, I never, I didn't realize I was signing up for the, all of this, but you know, yeah. I would never change that. So, you know, be grateful for where you've been. And like you said, like some of this practical stuff, it goes a really long way. Like get by yourself, go out in the woods, really give some, some time to think about what it is that brings you joy. Because sometimes it's been so long since we've experienced it. 
we just don't really know. We, we, we only know the joy that we experienced maybe when we were 20 or 25, because that was the last time we really did anything that was for us. Because ever since then, you've been serving other people. So it's time for you to be able to get back in the driver's seat and honor yourself by investing some time in doing some of that groundwork. It goes so far for your health, like your mm -hmm. physiology follows your emotions. It follows your, your mindset, the way that you think about yourself. I'm telling you just like Dr. V, I mean, it's just so cool to see how your story, it wasn't that you decided, well, I'm going to start lifting all these weights and juicing and doing smoothies and doing all this stuff. It was like, it started in your head first and then your body followed. So I have one last question because anybody that is this intentional and mindful, I just want to know what is like a daily non-negotiable practice for you that you do that you just like do religiously. Cause I love these things. Cause I feel like it always <laughs> just gets my creative mind going, thinking like, maybe this is something I could implement. Yeah. Mm, mm, so good. Uh, I only adopted this recently but I recognize that these non-negotiables um, ha have gone a long way. And that's to kiss my partner deeply and just to tell her from a place of presence where I'm not like on my phone and, and not distracted, just how much I love her. Mm. Spend intentional time with my children and just be there present, not thinking about other things and business, and just really be and cherish that moment. And I recognize that those things can, can really, really ground me. And, it, and if, if I may just take a, a, you know, a quick few minutes, when you mentioned sort of like, if you're struggling and stuck, I want you to reframe this because that struggling and stuckness means you're on your way. That struggling and stuckness is, that, is actually one of the, the most initial steps for you to, 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 to remember who you are, because there are some people who are just going through life, you know, doing their thing and they don't feel that way. But mm -hmm. when you start to feel that way, you're like, hmm, something's not quite right. That's really the early steps for you to start to change. That's what, where I was about seven years ago. And here's one really cool trick when you think, oh man, I, I wasted so much time doing X, Y, Z. Well, one, you could take where you're at now, but also imagine yourself in this field of longevity now where we're living 50, 100, 150 years longer. Imagine that version of yourself and all this time that you have to become that. Is it this person of love that's surrounding people, that's serving the world and doing all that stuff? And then from that place, imagine that person come down and visit where you are now. Mm -hmm. And then from that consciousness, just go, oh, why did those things happen there? What was that my past? Why is that happening to me now? And if you could come from that consciousness, you could almost retrospectively give yourself the knowledge and wisdom of why your life had to be your life for you to be you. So it's mm -hmm. all good. Well, I'm going to start practicing that today. I'm not kidding, Doc. Okay. I mean, wow. I had never thought about that way to, from that bird's eye view, but bringing that consciousness down. Well, I've got homework to do. Good, healthy homework, Doc. Um, I mean, I've learned a lot. I, I think I can speak for Courtney in this and saying that we've learned a lot and we feel inspired. Your energy and your focus and um, your eloquence really does uh, show. And I know it shows through your writing. Um, we're just so thankful for everything you've given us today and all the information you've shared. And I hope that we can all stay friends and like keep seeing each other and somehow like we reconnect. OK, and, and we really appreciate you. Um, where can people find out more about you? Where what is your Instagram feed? What is your social media, your website? How can they get a hold of you? Well, the best way to sort of get, get to know uh, myself and the, my work, um, mainly through Instagram, Dr. VMD, spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-V-M-D. Um, and if they want to just get a taste of some of these breathwork practices, I put together a jam-packed resource guide, lecture notes, you know, ebook, all together in a free package at thrivestatebreath.com. And you'll have access to some exercises, lots of resources to get you started on your longevity and health journey. That's right. You have a podcast too, right? I have the Thrive State podcast. Listen to right. that. That's right. Thank right. you for plugging me in. <laughs> I know. I well, because I was checking it out and I was like, oh man, there's so much more here. So y'all, yeah, his podcast is great. Um, you've got tons of articles online too, which I just I went deep down the rabbit hole and I was like, man, this stuff is just gold. There's just so many little nuggets here. So I mean, just an incredible work you're doing. And you know, you are serving your purpose because you can tell it's it's almost effortless for you because it's exactly what you're designed to do and you're 
message is so clear and it's resonating so much. I know for me and our listeners. So we just are so honored to have had some time with you today and just wish you so much of, you know, the best in the next season ahead of you. I know that it's going to be fruitful in everything that you do. So guys, Thank you for joining us today. It's always so great to have your time as well. We really consider it a privilege to serve you. And I hope that this has um, has at least encouraged you and given you some things to think about as you go about your week. So we love you. You know, like, subscribe, hit us up over at the Health Institute on Instagram. You can message Dr. Motley or myself on our personal platforms, but we love you guys. We consider you family. Know that we are deeply invested in your personal development as well. So we will see you guys on the next episode. See you, everybody.